Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. There have been many times over the last 100 years where technology has changed the way we make music. Take the microphone, for example. Before it came along, singers had to be naturally louder than the orchestra behind them. They needed to have a voice that could reach the back rows of the theater. But when the microphone came along, certain singers like Bing Crosby realized that you could use it to create a whole new mood for singing by getting up close and personal. Kind of like this. Amplification was another game changer. At one point, you needed a dozen or so people in a band just to fill the room with music. With amps, you needed fewer people to make as much noise. Magnetic tape and multi-track recording made it possible to create entirely new soundscapes, the kind that you could never get in the real world. The studio became an instrument for all these new sonic frontiers. And then we had developments like the electric guitar. And I don't think I need to tell you how much that changed everything. This is how things were for the late 50s, through the 60s, and into the 1970s. Amps and mics and electric guitars and multi-track recording gear. Those were the tools for making modern music. But then there was another change that started to be really felt in the mid-70s. A new era featuring electronic machines that made sounds that had never been imagined anywhere in the universe. So many new possibilities opened up during an era that became known as the golden age of synthesizers. Everything changed and changed fast. So, if you're into any flavor of today's electronic music, you will find this fascinating. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. There's the very synth-friendly MGMT from 2008 with Time to Pretend. They make a lot of use of a Korg keyboard called the Monopoly. They also used a program called Reason, some music production software that came with a lot of built-in synth sounds that you can manipulate as you see fit. Getting sounds like this today is easy. The free apps that you get on your phone or tablet are awesome. But it always wasn't this way. And that's where we're going with this show. Welcome again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is a look at the golden age of synthesizers, that era when synths first became small enough, cheap enough, and powerful enough to have an effect on the direction of musical composition. Synthesizer technology goes back to at least the 1940s. A special electronic lab was created in Cologne, West Germany in 1951. Columbia University in New York also had a synthesizer that filled an entire room, and the first portable synth had to be transported from place to place, and I'm not kidding about this, on a rail car. They ran very hot, consumed huge amounts of electricity, and were impossibly complex to program. That began to change in the 1960s, when engineers like Don Buchla and Bob Moog began to manufacture small, solid-state units. They were still expensive and insanely untamable, and as such, they were treated mostly as nerdy novelties. But there were people who believed in this new technology. The monkeys were among the first, if not the very first, to use a synth on a record. This appeared in a 1967 song called Star Collector. Towards the end of the 1960s, a classical musician named Wendy Carlos used some Moog gear to record music like this. And then in 1969, a guy by the name of Gershon Kingsley adopted the name Hot Butter and created this bit of synthesizer pop called popcorn. Again, kind of cool, but still mostly a novelty thing. But then, in 1974, came Kraftwerk. They were from Dusseldorf, in what was then West Germany. 
And they were part of a generation of musicians who were looking for a sound that would set Germany apart from the rest of the world. And because the country had a long history with experimenting with electronic music, remember how I said that studio opened in 1951 in Cologne? The guys in Kraftwerk decided that they would go down this road. No, wait, sorry. This Autobahn. Autobahn by Kraftwerk. The original version is almost 23 minutes long, but that radio edit turned into a huge hit all over the world. And while some people still regarded an all-electronic song to be nothing more than a curiosity, somehow this time it was different. And there were two reasons it was different. First of all, synth gear was rapidly coming down in price, and keyboards were getting smaller and more portable. The second reason was the punk rock explosion, and we'll get to that in a minute. This era, from, let's say, 75 forward, ushered in the golden age of classic synthesizers. And to help us navigate through this era, I've got Andy McCluskey and Paul Humphreys from OMD. Playing as orchestral maneuvers in the dark, they were an integral part of that era, that time. And they're still at it today, 40 years later. So I got them to act as our tour guides through the early days of synth music and techno pop. So let's go back to, I guess, 1970, what, six? With you guys, mm -hmm. uh, first getting together. Yeah. And in 76, nobody outside of Kraftwerk and a few other people were playing synths. So how did you yeah. guys actually begin? We weren't actually playing synths because we couldn't afford one. <laughs> <laughs> so we were playing all these noise machines. You see, I, I, I was, my hobby was electronics. And, you know, what you have to understand is we're two working class boys from, from the outskirts of Liverpool who had absolutely no money. And synthesizers were prohibitively expensive to us as kids. So I used to kind of go around to my auntie's houses and see old radios on the shelves and say, can I have that? And then I used to take them home and rip them apart and make turn them into what we used to call those noise making machines that were kind of synthesizers, but uh, they, they never didn't have really, a keyboard. No, and they didn't quite make the same noise from one minute to the next. <laughs> but uh, what, was this before or after you were Hitler's underpants? This was before. This was. I mean, yeah. but that, I'm sorry. Yeah. I once named that the worst band name ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it is. But but <laughs> but we can confidently claim that once upon a time we were in Hitler's <laughs> underpants. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, we we got fascinated by doing alternative music inspired by Kraftwerk and other German right. bands. Right. When we were, I thought I was 16, he was 15, because yeah. I went to go and see Kraftwerk play at the Liverpool Empire on September the 11th, 1975, and that transformed my life. That so was, that would have been the Radioactivity album. It was the Radioactivity mm -hmm. album, but Autobahn had just been a hit. It became a hit the year after in, in the UK, and that's what turned us both on to Kraftwerk. But because he was only 15... Yeah, my mum wouldn't let me go to gigs until I was 16, mm, so, so I missed that gig from Kraftwerk. <laughs> <laughs> so annoying. Never quite forgiven my mum for that. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you began making music with these noisemakers, or well, just noise. making noise? It was. I, I had a bass it guitar, noise. which I had bought with my money for my sixteenth birthday, and Paul had some friends, and I joined their band. But quickly, we realised we were more interested in doing our own stuff. So we go around to his mum's house because she was out at work on Saturday afternoons, and we would just make noise with his noisemaker machines, my bass, any effects pedals and things we could get. We made things with microphones in tubes with whistles attached to them. I mean, it was pretty weird ambient stuff. I mean, understandably, yeah. our friends thought it was terrible. Yeah, it became musical when I when I got a, a, a cheap electric piano and, a, and an organ. Yeah, what, but, do but you remember still, what that gear was? I mean, everybody's fascinated. Yeah, I know what exactly. It was what a Selma piano tron, uh -huh. which was like a reed based piano, so it just used to pluck a reed. And um, and it was a was it a Vox, Vox Jaguar? Jaguar organ, yeah. yeah, Vox Jaguar was the first one. One cost twenty five pounds, and the other cost thirty five pounds. They both yeah. look like they've been found in a skip outside some <laughs> junk place. Um, but, but it enabled me to learn keyboards and 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 be a bit more musical. Mm. And that's when we wrote Electricity, because when we got the Selma Pianotron, the first thing we wrote, that sound in Electricity, yeah. do, 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 that was, um, that was uh, the Selma Pianotron. What's, what's that, that sound just, that leads it off? Uh, the, well, there's, the, there's a... Psh, psh, yeah. That, that's just white noise, white noise which yeah. was off the first synth that we bought. Or 
Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark with their first big single, Electricity, from 1979. All right, back to Paul Humphreys and Andy McCluskey from the band. And before we go any further, we, we got to get the story of their name out of the way. The name, Orchestral Maneuvers mm-hmm. in the Dark. Uh, I remember hearing it for the first time and thinking, that's a bit pretentious. <laughs> totally. You're absolutely yep. right. Was absolutely. that the plan? Well, it was only going to be one gig, so it didn't matter what we were going to call ourselves. It was literally this whole thing. We're 40 years in now, but it was just going to be one gig. We so, um, we used to go to a club in Liverpool called Eric's, which was great. I mean, very famous club. All of the All of the... All of the most interesting bands played there. I mean, it was a basement dump, but, you know, The Clash, The Sex Pistols, Devo, Perubu, The Cure, XTC, ev- you know, everybody played there. And everybody in the audience also had aspirations to do music. Mm-hmm. And they had a great open-door policy on Thursday night. It was free for members to get in. You didn't get paid, but you got a showcase. So one day we finally plucked up the courage to say, okay, instead of just doing this in your mother's back room, why don't we go and ask if we can go and do a gig? So we knocked on the door uh, very sheepishly and so I said, um, do you mind, could, could we, uh, and they recognised us because we were always in the club, said, could we come and do just two of us with synthesizer music? I went, yeah, yeah, what you called them? I went, uh, we'll don't get back know. to you on that one. <laughs> Rushed round to my house. On my bedroom wall, it was like my kind of writing book. and We were looking for something on the wall, like, what can we call ourselves? Looking, And we had this actually song that was going to be made of war noises and weird stuff, so collage of... Orchestral sounds. Yeah. Um, called orchestral movies. And we went, OK, we're not punk, we're not disco, we're not pop, we're... That'll do. That'll tell people that we're, we're weird, two guys in a tape recorder. So we called ourselves Orchestral News in the Dark, utterly pretentious. The only thing I'll say is it could have been worse. Right below it was Margaret Thatcher's Afterbirth. We could have been called that. <laughs> yeah, MTA instead of OMG. You, know. <laughs> you guys are also the subject of the greatest newspaper headline ever written. Really? Uh, It was a small town UK paper, I don't know where it was from, but some birds had found a spot to make a nest and were looking after their eggs. And the birds were kestrels. And the headline was Four Kestrels Man Oeuvres in the Dark. (laughs) Oh, I don't even remember seeing that one. Oh, that's... uh... (laughs) Yeah, no, there the, the have been... Do you know what? We deserve it for a name like that. <laughs> yeah, we, we do. <laughs> <laughs> OMD and the golden age of vintage synthesizer music. Back with more in a second. This is a program on the earliest days of modern synthesizer music, the period between the mid-70s and the mid-80s, when this new technology was changing so much about how music was made and performed. And our guides for this tour are Andy McCluskey and Paul Humphreys of OMD, a band that was right in the thick of it all. The synths and related gear that they used back then is highly collectible today. So let's let's go through some of their inventory. So outside of your bass guitar, mm-hmm. you've always been 100% electronic based. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, we pretty much yeah. were. I mean, we, we did use acoustic drums um, because in the early days, because you couldn't program, we, there were no programmable drum machines. Mm. But we wouldn't let our drummer play them as a kit because we didn't want all that loose rock and roll spillage. So poor Malcolm Holmes used to have to play the bass drum on its own, then the snare drum, then the hi-hat. We wouldn't even let him have a cymbal for the first three albums because they thought yeah. they were a rock and roll cliche. Yeah, we wanted it to sound <laughs> syncopated like a drum machine. So he kind of, he was a great drummer but learned to play like a drum machine. Interesting. Yeah. So this gear that you're talking about, 78, mm-hmm. 79, do you still have it? Yeah, yeah, we do. We still have the uh, the Korg Micro preset is now in a museum in Liverpool. <laughs> in fact, it's all go- it's all going into back into another museum in Liverpool because there's the British Music Experience Museum in Liverpool, and they're doing an exhibition of us. And we've managed to track down quite a lot of our old k- things that have been in storage and lent to people. And I mean, it looks like the biggest pile of junk ever. And th- yeah, there we really were trying to be the future of music with all this secondhand crap. Well, this is <laughs> this, this is the thing that a lot of people today find so fascinating. Fascinating is these things, these old keyboards and um, the outboard gear. They were all really finicky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that you never knew really what mm-hmm. kind of sound you were getting going to get out of it. Yeah, even though the presets 
were the same from gig to gig, they might sound different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you had to be really creative to make these sounds actually sound like something, you know. You had to really work at it and process them and and, and choose the notes carefully. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But, you know, the, 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 the programmable synthesizers, when we moved away from the presets, they were still little monophonic ones, like the, the, uh, the Roland SH1s. Paul and Martin um, used to have to have little flashlights, which they'd stick in their mouths and hold them to program with both, frantically trying to set up the patches between in, each in, song. in between songs to get to them. And, of course... They would never be right. And then be you'd come in, and, and if, if it was wrong, you'd be like, oh, it's got too much release on it, or <laughs> portmanteau or something. I you forgot know, to turn the filter up, you know. Oh, well, yeah, how, how did you manage your gigs? Well, they were fraught with difficulty, It really. was terrifying, actually. It was <laughs> terrifying, and something would always break down. And I, I ended up having to have a collection of jokes to tell yeah, the did, audience actually, yeah. to fill in the gaps while they were trying to fix something or get something <laughs> sorted out. When yeah. did... OK, so polyphonic keyboards come along 80, 81? Since, yeah. 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 I think like our DX first seven. one... Yeah, I think our first Profit one was Profit 5. five yeah, so the Profit 5 and the DX7 were two big machines. I mean, yeah. everybody had well, those we, keyboards. We didn't use the DX7 so much. We we went the Roland way with the Jupiter 8. We loved the Roland sounds. That was yeah. the first first proper Ju um, Roland Again, polyphonic. for the young kids, putting things into context, each manufacturer had a sound. Mm. Yeah, they did. So you were a Korg person. You were a... Roland, Roland person, person, you were a an Oberheim person, you yeah. were a Yamaha person, and yeah. they were all different. That's right. Yeah. They would, yeah, they just offered different things. We were definitely Korg and Roland. Weren't we, we were. We were pretty yeah. much, yeah, sequential circuits. <clears throat> but it, it was, um, <clears throat> it was really, you know, these things were big and heavy and cumbersome, and you had to reprogram between every song. And the, the, the funny thing is that now, you know, a lot of youngsters. Are looking to collect these things. You, you try and get a Jupiter Eight on e on eBay oh, it's now. It's like two thousand pounds or something. More because the young people are purists, whereas we are like, screw those things. They weigh a ton. They drift out of tune. You can't sync them with anything else. Give me the give me the, the one in, inside my computer. You know, I'll I'll have the soft synth in the computer. And they yeah, but you know, you you grew up with the real thing, man. I'm like, yeah, we did. We don't want them anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're I mean, the same people that threw out our vinyl records too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, we, I mean the, the good thing about the, the modern technology, the soft synths now are very, very close to the originals. And, I, you know, I, I love the fact that when I walk on stage and I'm still playing all these soft synths, still playing, you know, Jupiter 8s and Mellotrons and all these things. But I know when I press the, press the button that, that it's all going to be laid out, it's all going to be in tune, and it's going to sound the same as it did last night. I remember the reel-to-reel -reel tape machine on stage, Winston. Mm -hmm. What was Winston's job and what was... He called Winston. Okay. First of all, because there was only two of us making the music we liked and nobody else wanted to play with us, we needed a, a tape machine to be the rest of the band to put the drums on and anything we couldn't play as two of us. So we used to borrow, I think Paul's... Paul borrowed one of his aunt's reel to reels or something. Um, then, but he had a friend called Paul Collister who he went to school with, who had a, like a little home studio in the garage, and he owned Winston the four track TX. So when we went on stage, we would borrow Winston, and he's called Winston after Winston Smith, the hero from 1984 by George Orwell. That's where the name comes from. Okay, yeah. and and you know. Uh, it, as all our friends refused to play with us, Winston didn't have a choice. He had to play with us. <laughs> he did what he was told. <laughs> <laughs> so. OMD and Tesla Girls from 1984. There were so many Technopops trying the same things because back then... Synths were very punk, and playing them was a punk thing to do. And we'd better explain that statement. One thing that a lot of people also don't realize is that there was a certain amount of uh, punk rock aesthetic when it came to yeah. you by bands like you, who you had no musical ability. No. At no. least not 
you, well, you were you were. We were self-taught. Self-taught. We self-taught. Read music. Yeah. My, mo- my my mother even had a um, a school report uh, from my music teacher saying Paul Humphreys has absolutely no aptitude for music whatsoever. <laughs> uh, He's so, got a frame now. <laughs> but these new tools. But uh, but these yeah. I mean that was it. It was the punk sensibility. You, you know, just in, instead of just thrashing one chord on a guitar, we were just playing with two fingers on synths, and it was this, it's the same thing. It was a, it's the, but you were coming up with ethic, you, you were know. coming up with sounds that the human brain had never heard. before. Before, which was the cool thing about these new machines. That was the exciting yeah. thing about using electronics was it gave us um, access to a palette of sounds that were new and exciting uh, rather than just repeating what we saw in the mid to late 70s as, you know, just rock and roll cliches. It's like, oh, God, guitar, bass and drums, it's been done to death. Yeah. Hey, you know, there's no new way to do this. We want to try and make a different sound. But... What was the reaction from people who believed that you weren't making real music because all the machines were doing the work? Yeah, well, this was it. We were up against this all the time. Synthesizer music is not real music. It's like the machines are making the music for you. And it's it was just so ridiculous. But we, we were up against it for years that it was not... Because it didn't have a guitar, it wasn't real music. And, yeah, uh, it's not, not authentic, not manly, not rock and roll yeah. or sweaty enough. I mean, even, uh, even the music, musicians' union we were uh, fighting against as well because you know because we were you know using synthesized you know choral things or 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 synthesized mm-hmm. orchestral things we were taking jobs away from orchestras and uh, we West, were battling but when we it. started we was just two of us and we had a tape machine called Winston on stage and the musicians union had these fabulous big round stickers <laughs> saying keep music live which we had on the reels of our machine you know what? I remember those <laughs> stickers live on the stickers yeah and that was yeah it was us rebelling you know it, it, again it, us being punk and it wasn't just you it was everybody who it was Depeche Mode it was the normal it was everybody Human else League, that was everybody, yeah. Human League, that were, yeah. were, they were, you were taking food out of musicians' mouths because yeah. you weren't playing live, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, the other thing is, I mean, if a synthesizer had a button on it that said hit single, we would be pressing it every day. <laughs> but they don't. You still had to write the song and play it. These guys were contemporaries of OMD. And again, it was all about creating sounds that no one had ever heard before. It's Depeche Mode. It's getting hot. Depeche Mode and Just Can't Get Enough, a big single for them in 1980, just as this new post-punk all-electronic music called Technopop was starting to crest. Back with more with Paul Humphreys and Andy McCluskey on the Golden Age of Synths in just a sec. We're talking about the Golden Age of Synthesizers, those early days from the mid-70s to the mid-80s, where this new technology shook up so much about music, especially in the realm of alt-rock. And our guides are Paul Humphreys and Andy McCluskey of OMD. And they would know because they were there. Here they are talking about a machine called a Mellotron. Did you ever have a Mellotron? Yeah. Oh, oh yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we took it on the road. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> we, I mean, this is, again, the funny thing is, in our third album, Architectural Malice, we got a Mellotron because we wanted strings and choirs and things. And, of course, you know, that, was, that was a piece of antique stuff. Explain what it, how a Mellotron actually was. Okay. Well, it, it's basically um, that there is a tape. It's not a tape loop. It's a piece of tape that lasts about 20 seconds. No, it's 11. Oh, oh is it? Yeah. All right. Okay, 11. <laughs> and uh, and when you press that key, it pushes the tape onto a head until the tape runs out, and then there's a spring that loads it back in. So you can't hold a note more than 11 seconds. Yeah. If you want the chord of the note to last longer, you're going to go to wind the tape back and drop in and, uh, and extend it. But there's a whole loom. There's about 36 tapes on a whole loom with all these springs attached. And to change the sound, you have to take the top off, unscrew it, pull out one loom, put the string loom in, having taken yeah. the choir loom, bolt it all down, and then play it. And there's a big flywheel running with this long bar that when you press the key, it, it makes the, the tape roll over the head. Fine, except when you're playing in a tent with a generator or something and the power goes down, uh, he's, you know, which has happened to us a few times, I said, yeah. he's chasing the pitch wheel, trying to, yeah. it's going slow, it's going slow, I'm losing the tune. Oh, because if, if you had voltage issues. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it, we did this gig in France, it was in a small town in France, and I couldn't in the sound check get, get it in tune. And I was speaking to the local guys and they said, well, it's because everyone's cooking in town, you have to wait <laughs> until people stop cooking before you can go on stage and it be in tune. 
Indeed. Yeah. I talked to Rick Wakeman once about playing a Mellotron. He hates them. <laughs> but, you know, at the time, they were basically the first sampling device. Yeah. And a lot of bands would actually... You could get your own tapes made up, and so you could play in your own special effects off one particular key. You could actually have a sound that was specifically, specifically on the yours. record that you couldn't recreate any other way. So, so they were like, like early samplers. samplers. Yeah, yeah. All right, so examples of Mellotron sounds would be the beginning of Strawberry Fields. Yes, yeah. uh, Whiter Shade of Pale. Uh, our song Made of Orleon, which sounds like a bagpipe, is actually a, viol- oh, is it? a violin sound off of uh, Mellotron. From Mellotron. Yeah. Uh, and, even uh, Leonard Skinner, um, Tuesday's Gone, I think, oh, yeah. features a Mellotron on it. Yeah, yeah. and Pink Floyd so, used it, used it ex- yeah. extensively. But the, the, f- the flute on Strawberry Fields is probably the most famous Mellotron sound. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay, let's get back to the idea of, of polyphonic synths. Uh, that must have opened up everything because now you could play, you could play chords. chords. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, because before then, if you wanted chords from a synth, you used to have to play it, play each note down on a multi-track tape, and then and then build them up over three. If you wanted a triad, you have to use three tracks of single notes to make the triad. You know, but um, yeah, so it, this whole new thing opened up, uh, all new possibilities. When did drum machines come into the picture? We used to have an old drum machine right in the early days that was just the sort of thing that you used to have with your home organ, and it just pressed much like Bossa Nova 1, Bossa Nova 2, Tango, etc., which we did use on a couple of tracks on the first album. And the Elgam organ had one as oh, well. Oh, that's right, the Elgam. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we actually used that. You know, the, the accompaniment where you hold the chord and the whole thing just goes... <laughs> we used that on a couple of songs. Yeah, but um, the first programmable drum machine we got is most famously probably known for the intro to Enola Gay. The, the Roland CR78, you could program that. It was very complicated, but we programmed the... And, and that that is the distinctive intro pattern that goes all the way through yeah, Enola Gay. As soon as people hear that, they know it's Enola that, Gay. That was, a, that was a Roland drum machine. We still got that, and that's going in the museum as well. Yeah. <laughs> Back with more from Paul Humphreys and Andy McCluskey on the techno-pop era of the 70s and 80s. And this is where the conversation turns to movies. Through the 70s and through the early part of the 80s, you guys were um, you were big in the UK, you had following Europe, and you had spots of love coming at you from North America. Yeah. yeah. Mainly, uh, Canada. mainly Canada. Mainly <laughs> Canada. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then John Hughes comes along. Mm. Yeah, and you start getting songs on those wonderful John Hughes movies from the 1980s. Mm. How did things change after that? We got um, the biggest change for us actually happened just before that when we changed record labels because the record label we were on in the states couldn't get us arrested and didn't care. We moved to A and M, and that's when they started to push us, and then. Two years into our A and M career, yeah, John Hughes came along. He used he used Tesla Girls in Weird Science, but you have to really listen for it. It's playing in the background. But then he came to us. He was a real anglophile with his music, and yeah, he um, loved his bands. I I I have a suspicion actually that you know many of his Brat Pack movies they were about kids who were kind of like outsiders. You know, they weren't the cheerleaders and the jocks. They were the, the, the kind of weirdos who dressed differently. And I suspect that the the soundtracks that he put together, which were very often British and quite often electronic, would be the sort of alternative music that those kids in the films would listen to. So that's why it made sense for him to ask people like us. And yeah, he he asked us to write a song for Pretty in Pink. And And there was was you, and then there was Psychedelic Furs, Mm -hmm. New Order. uh, Simple Minds. Simple Minds, yes. Kim Wilde. I mean, it's... Yeah, it was a lot of English music, but it was... We were really flattered because we, we, obviously we'd seen how successful Simple Minds had been off Breakfast Club. So when he asked us, we were like, "Hell yeah!" We were what was the song for you? What for for, uh, for us? Yeah. Uh, well, initially we wrote a song called "Goddess of Love," and <laughs> which um, nobody's heard of. Which nobody's heard of because uh, yeah, because we, um, we 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 wrote it to the script and then. Um, 
uh, John Hughes changed the end of the film without us knowing. And then we, 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 we had a couple of days off in L.A. before a massive tour started. We were coming to mix Goddess of Love in L.A. We get this emergency call saying, guys, guys, your song doesn't work anymore. Can you write us a new one? And we're like, you're kidding. We've got two days before a long tour. Our equipment has gone to San Francisco. We've got no instruments. And you want us to write a new song? And he said, yeah, I'll book you into Larrabee Studios in L.A. You hire whatever you need and write us a new song. And so in one day, mm-hmm. before the equipment, the hire gear came, we wrote a song. The only, yeah. the, the only time we've ever written a song this way, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, because the equipment hadn't arrived from the rental company and we were pressed for time, Paul sat down at a piano, which he never does to write. Do. And I sat next him and started writing words and we like we old school did. Tin Pan Alley songwriters gathered round the piano and we blocked out the chords to if you leave that way then we got the, the a, a rented Fairlight in yeah. it didn't have a very good drum library but the engineer Tom Lord Alger who'd come to mix for us said don't worry I'll load up some samples so the big drum for the ba doo 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 he chopped up a Phil Collins drum sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't tell Phil. Um, and, um, yeah, and we wrote If You Leave in a day. We finished about three in the morning, sent a cassette by bike rider to Paramount Studios, then got a phone call about half eight the next day, having had about two hours sleep. Jet lag to hell. And the next morning, I managed to, John loves the song, get back in and finish. We're like, oh, God, okay, yeah, you know. <laughs> Go and do some more overdubs. And then two weeks later, when we had the first day off on tour, we came back to L.A. and mixed it at uh, Giorgio Moroder's studio. And so, yeah completely off the top of our heads in one day we wrote our biggest song in North America. Yeah, I was about to say it yeah. did okay. It, it did didn't right. do too badly. And it was um you know it, it, it was it was it was just nuts and then and then and then we all assumed that because the the film was called Pretty in Pink that the lead single would be the psychedelic first song. Pretty in Pink Pretty would be the pink. obvious one. Wasn't it? I don't remember. No. no. The they went, was ours. They went with, they asked us, and we weren't ready for them. But you don't, you don't say no. We want the lead single, all the press is going to be. So we just released the song Secret, and it had gone to radio. It was getting massive radio play. And we had to take it off the radio before it was in, on, on sale to get If You Leave out. So everybody knows Secret, but nobody, nobody bought it as a single because mm. it was never actually released. And If You Leave went out there and the course was massive. As the 80s turned into the 90s, keyboard technology kept getting better, more powerful, easier to use, and even more versatile. Samplers, MIDI, and all manner of outboard gear. And the sonic palette available to musicians continues to expand. It's crazy to think that what once took piles and piles of gear back in those early days can now be emulated on your phone. Thanks to Paul Humphreys and Andy McCluskey of OMD for being our guides to the golden age of synths and the rise of technopop. It's always best when you can go right to the source for this sort of thing. If you would like the podcast version of this program, it's available through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you get on-demand music. There are hundreds available for free download, perfect for binging. There's my website, which is a journal of musical I update it every single day with music news and opinion and information. And if you want to keep track of the updates, there's the free daily newsletter that goes along with it. You should subscribe. You should subscribe. I can also be found on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you want to reach me directly, email works fastest. It's alan at alancross.ca. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. Talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. 